Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, today we are joined by, of course, Dr. Mensa, uh, and also by Dr. Mike Lukens. Uh, Dr. Lukens is a, a psychologist, a life coach, uh, and just an overall great guy. And we're, we're looking forward to having a conversation with Dr. Lukens today about the connection between the brain and the mind. Um, I wanna remind everyone, this is part of the Integrative Mental Health Summit series. Uh, we are, as always, proud to be partnering with uh, our friends Journey's Dream uh, and bringing you more and more content uh, that builds upon the great momentum that we started during the Integrative Mental Health Summit back in October. And of course, we're planning for another summit uh, in the months to come, but uh, excited to continue bringing you content and continue uh, sharing with you important ideas uh, that can contribute to your uh, increased understanding, your increased mental health, your increased access to resources and, and great information. And so with that said, um, I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Mensa and, and allow him to, to give a brief introduction on behalf of, of Mensa Medical and the Mensa Research Institute. And then um, the two of them will have a conversation. I'll jump in. If you've got questions, by all means, uh, send them to us. You can use the chat function there in Zoom uh, and send us your questions and we'll get to them. Uh, a little bit later on after Dr. Lukens and Dr. Mintz have had a chance to at least give us some foundational uh, ideas on this topic. Dr. Mintz, take it away. So thank you, Mr. Wells. First of all, I wanna say, Mike, thank you so much for um, agreeing to do this. It's, it's a very important topic. And it's one that you know we oftentimes um, muse about, but we don't really get too much into it. You know, We kind of all assume, well, of course, the mind is there and it's part of the brain and that's function and so forth and so forth. But wait a minute, they're not the same thing. Um, we've got a, a, an entity that is different. We know that the brain, when it's dysregulated, affects the mind, but we also know that the mind, when it's challenged, can affect not just the brain, but the body. And all three of these parts are connected, but we oftentimes don't really try to really ascertain or, or dig deeper into these component parts. So, Mike, we're so glad and grateful that um, you, you agreed to, to share with us. Um, Mike, you know, why don't you just go ahead and, and start? How do we look at this, this phenomenon? How do you assess this? You, you've written uh, three new books now. Um, you've got a, a great deal going on. Share with us, please, your, your knowledge and wisdom at this point. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, when you're introducing me, I, I would have added emotions theorist. But uh, the, uh, the idea that um, the brain and the mind are not exactly the same thing, it's been with us, I, you know, I think it's a concept, as a basic understanding even John and Jane Doe have. And yet, you know, the experts have been discussing, debating, philosophizing, you know, bringing some objective empirical science to bear. You know, we're all over the map with this thing, trying to sort of pin it down. And I suspect, uh, like, quantum phenomena in general, we may never get to the point where we're done talking about it, trying to figure it out. So, uh, so e even as we do this, I, I've been developing this theory, what I refer to as the physics of emotions for about 30 some years, uh, got turned on to uh, the idea of emotions being important. I think it was about 1983 when I, when I encountered uh, a guy named Sylvan Tompkins, he was invited to uh, University of Connecticut to, to give a colloquium. And um, he had already published his major books on emotion theory back in, I think the mid sixties, late sixties. And here it was the eighties and I'm studying clinical psychology and I'm hearing about him for the first time. Like this, this was not a time when emotions were being paid much attention to. 
So we went from cognition to brain science and we're still trying to figure out what we want to do with emotion. So if I might, uh, I'll just go ahead with the PowerPoint um, and begin to kind of show people what it is that my thinking consists of on the matter. All right, so this is um, something I put together uh, really for today's uh, discussion. I talk about the difference between uh, the vegetative and volitional forces that motivate us. And, and you know, Albert, you were talking about the, uh, the brain influencing uh, the mind, obviously, and, but then also the mind influencing the, the brain. So the, the sharp distinction between these two things um, doesn't exist um, in terms of uh, a clear and inarguable you know, line in the sand. So for instance, you know, we, we look at breathing <clears throat> respiration as a vegetative uh, process. It's controlled by the brain. Uh, and I'm kind of fond of telling a story. Uh, when I was nine or 10, I was lying in my bed one afternoon, just daydreaming and thinking about my breathing for some reason or another. And uh, it dawned on me that as I paid attention to my breathing, um, it was under my control. And then I had the scary thought, well, what happens at night when I go to sleep and I'm not paying any attention to my breathing? So I had like a, a little short mini panic attack and went downstairs and asked my mother. She made up some pseudoscience gobbledygook, but she sounded reassuring. So I, I slept okay that evening. But, but, it, but it brought up that, that consideration, like how do these things actually work? Um, and there I am, you know, just sort of growing into my own mind, realizing its power, its reach, its scope, its, you know, its, its assumed influence on things. And I realized it could kill me easily. <laughs> the mind is a dangerous thing if you give it that much power. Um, so the, the, the distinction is fuzzy for me today, less fuzzy because I've studied the heck out of it, but it's still, like I said, hard to pin down. What we, you know, if we cut open the brain and look at what's happening there, we see all this electrochemical uh, activity. You know, the brain's firing all the time. <clears throat> and uh, we drill down and we see what that's uh, made of. And there's some sort of information, I guess, that comes from the neurochemicals. Uh, but meanwhile, you, you know, if, if you were to be able to cut open a mind, and I don't know how you would do that because it's, it doesn't really have a physical location. But if you were to examine its contents, there, there's no chemistry in it. There's meaningful information. There's not chemical information. So, so somehow, these two different substrates transform back and forth. They, they communicate to each other. They co-influence each other. And the brain using a certain form of data and information, the mind using different forms. And the question then would be, how does this get transformed? Where does that happen? How does that happen? So somehow the brain sending the serotonin or the norepinephrine and the mind is decoding it for its own purposes. So this is where I'm talking about the idea that this is a circularly organized system, brain, mind, communication, and influence is circular. If I uh, get drunk at night, I'm introducing chemistry that's definitely going to influence my, my mind and my emotioning. When I wake up in the morning, I've, I've depleted my chemical substrate, so that's now influencing how I wake up with or without any kind of emotional self-recrimination for having gotten drunk, just in terms of the alteration of the physiology. So there you see that dance with drinking, mind influencing body, body influencing mind in turn. <clears throat> so who's in charge? Well, that's not really the right question. I think when, when you look at the, uh, the volitional realm where we're making decisions and choices, we can't see the influence of the chemistry, we will feel it. So, so for instance, I just got a phone call 
that had bad news. Meanwhile, I just took a shot of serotonin. That bad news will be less bad to me in some respects. I'll have a buffer from the mood elevation from the chemistry. Similarly, if, you, if, you, if I took the bad news with a hangover, I'm gonna be two times as cranky. Another way to look at this dance, uh, we look at hunger pangs. Obviously, hunger is a brain-supported uh, process, brain-sponsored process. But when the hunger pangs and the signals arrive at the doorway of the mind, it has to integrate itself into the meaningful world of the moment. So is it a good time for me to eat? I, I might be on my way to a restaurant that's 30 minutes away, and then we're gonna wait for an hour and a half after we get there, and I'm with a group of people. Do I, do I consider the hunger pangs unfortunate? Do I use them to communicate urgency to, to the people I'm with? Do I try to pretend to myself that they're not bothering me so I can sustain my smile and, and keep the, uh, the social performance going? You see, that's not specified by hunger patterns. So that when the mind weighs in on things, <laughs> the, the two things to, to sort of illustrate here. So, so one is what we know of as the patellar reflex. So I can have motor movement happen in my leg, having no input from my mind. And in fact, you know, the first time you experience that, your mind is doing surprise that somehow the doctor found that perfect spot on your <laughs> kneecap to make your legs shoot out without you deciding you wanted to do that. It's like, it's like amazing. Now, now what about a sneeze? You know, the sneeze is coming and we're sort of dancing with it and our mind is recognizing, you know, this is coming from the body and is it a good time to sneeze, isn't it? Some people will try to make the sneeze happen and get it over with. Some people try to suppress it depending on where you are. And it's almost as if the sneeze kind of has a mind of its own, but our mind is wrestling with it. So what we get from the brain in, in terms of what arrives in our mind somehow is only part of what we're working with. The mind has to work with things that can't be found in the brain and can't be reduced to chemistry. Not that it can't be mirrored or paralleled by some chemical process, but, but the cause of it does not lie in the chemistry. So, I, I have a meaningful world full of objects and relationships, and these are specified by my mind, not by the uh, patellar reflex level of data input. In other words, I see a person, I recognize them from my history, I conjure the entire context of my relationship, as part of what I'm relating to at the moment. You cannot find this in a brain. You cannot change some of the natural structure of that by altering the brain, short of damaging the brain, you know, actually injuring it. So as drunk as I am, well, of course I could be so drunk, I'm completely unconscious, but as long as I'm conscious drunk, my mother is still my mother. Like, like those meanings don't get altered. So what I've discovered in the course of time, working to start with from Sylvan Tompkins' basic emotions list, this is the list of fundamental, or what I call the atomic emotioning elements. And I call them atomic like that, kind of to uh, re refer indirectly or, or draw the parallel between this list and the, uh, the periodic table in chemistry. You know, these, these, are, these are elements that have a certain structure that structure is kind of immutable and, uh, and each one is different from the others because of the way that, that it's structured. So we have fear, anger, sadness, disgust, guilt, and shame. I put those on the left side because in general, we consider those negative emotions. And that's a whole conversation about why and how they're negative uh, in, in our own minds. <clears throat> on the right side, we have interest and desire and joy. 
And you notice the design um, discrepancy here, three, six on the negative side, three on the positive side. I don't think the number actually means that much, but it is noteworthy. So this is my premise that, that when it comes to the mind, these are the foundational motivating forces that, that individually or collectively determine our choices and our decisions. So if, if I drop a, a human being in physical space, we can predict its movement based on the physics of the physical world. If we were to quote unquote, drop the person in meaningful space, the physics of the physical world won't tell us a damn thing except where to find the person. <laughs> What's going on for them, what, they'll, what they will decide to do with the act or the experience of falling is up to their mind. It's not up to the physics that we can observe and see objectively. That doesn't mean there isn't a physics. And this is what's important. I, I think sort of in terms of the philosophy of science and in terms of the, the pursuit of this idea about the mind having some uh, uh, independent validity kind of unto itself, I think we abandoned that back in the 60s and 70s when, when behaviorism was first refuted. Uh, I don't know if you guys recall the, the, the famous uh, conversation back and forth between uh, uh, Chomsky and uh, B.F. Skinner. But Chomsky was chiding Skinner on his model for oversimplifying language development. It was really the crux of the argument. And, and as far as uh, Chomsky's argument went, it seemed um, irrefutable that there had to be more to the mind and how it, it, it generates language in that capacity than just simple reinforcement um, and you know, uh, learning history. Now, like that wasn't complex enough. I figured out somewhere into the middle of all this that we needed to consider love. And it was actually uh, one day in the shower where I was having a grandiose moment because I was making headway on the book. And I'm thinking so that there's going to be this conversation, you know, about you know, pe people trying to sort of pick apart the theory, which is you know, natural. And I, I was sort of imagining somebody coming up with a microphone and saying, so doctor, you, you, you claim to know a lot about emotions. Uh, you don't say much about love. What's up with love? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, I need, I need to address that. Because <laughs> it wasn't in Tompkins scheme either. And so it didn't sort of dawn on me that this would be important to distinguish. Again, this is a whole other conversation, but I've, I've come to discover the importance of love as a more of a, a meta emotional position that we have. As, as we look out to the world or we look at ourselves or we look at others. And uh, you can think of the, uh, the infant and the child as being very naturally love oriented, to be interested, to be open, to be accepting. Over the course of time, when, when being open and accepting um, seems to be linked to pain and seems to be linked to avoidable pain, we defensively begin to take control of our relationship with the world. And this is where uh, trouble actually begins for us in, in terms of our neuroses, in terms of our self-defeatism. Um, love uh, eventually, depending on the relationship to pain, gets replaced by contempt, which is an orientation more of rejecting the world, rejecting others and rejecting itself. So I tie these two uh, levels of motivational force <clears throat> coming from the mind. And, uh, and from this um, awareness, from this template, the way that I interact with people in, in the coaching or in the therapy is to uh, create an ambivalence profile. So, so we look at what, what fear, the person has, what anger the person has, what sadness, what disgust, what guilt, shame, interest, desire, and joy. If we're looking at um, the, the image of the person in the moment, we're looking for what's occurring for them this moment. If we're looking uh, more in terms of characterological um, structures for the person, we're looking at 
tendencies over time. And uh, we recognize some influence as these develop over the course of time, starting with the, um, the different temperament at birth. And, uh, and clearly, you know, the range of individual differences when it comes to this, and what you might call the plasticity involved in uh, learning and changing our orientation to these things. The profile, the ambivalence profile is a little bit fluid, even if we're looking at uh, a long-term um, set of tendencies. Uh, but this is what I'm really trying to find out, uh, the intensity, whether this is being resisted or uh, the person finds it tolerable, some of the relevant content, you know, like, like when did you first find you had this fear, the relevant history, uh, the defensive strategies. Um, and what I found over the course of time is that our defense is a, an emotional response to an emotional response. It's a second order emotional response. So I have fear and I'm afraid of my fear, or I have fear and I'm angry that I have fear or a little bit of both. And so the anger and fear in the second instance is a response to the original fear experience in the first instance. So we begin the, uh, the ambivalence that involves our arm wrestling ourselves. And again, this is where we, the self-defeatism is generated and sustained. So unlike most uh, clinicians and theorists, it's, it's become clear to me that defenses are more of the problem than we've ever realized. We sort of take for granted that defenses support us and protect us. And while that's true at the, at the point at which they're formed in terms of our motives for doing so, our motives for clinging to our defenses are more questionable. And long after they've outlived their usefulness, you know, like the appendix, the, the vestigial defense that's no longer helpful is probably harmful. It's probably limiting growth and development. So that's just an important wrinkle. So there you have the, uh, the fast and skinny on the, the theory and the method. So what we're looking at is a very interesting interplay. And I think for those who are kind of new to this and are, are just trying to, as they say, uh, sift their, through their brain, their mind, really, mm -hmm. um, the different segments of this, it becomes very, very intriguing because for so long, we've talked about neurotransmitter activity uh, with regard to emotions. We've talked about uh, influencing neurotransmitters with pharmaceutical agents. And now what you're saying is that well, the mind is different than that. It's not actually influenced by that per se. Um, here's a question for you though, Mike. So in our world, we deal with biochemical imbalances that typically affect neurotransmitters or cellular activity or cellular function. If a person is dysregulated, however, in general, the, the signals that the mind is to interpret from the brain are actually aberrant signals. And therefore it would seem kind of logical that if you've got abnormal, abnormal or aberrant signals from the brain, the mind can't make the right assessment, right? No, of course not. You know, if, 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 you, if you spill coffee on your hardware, you can expect your software to get all screwed up. Indeed. Indeed. So, so all the coffee and all the toxins and all the poisons that are, you know, taking up residence inside our hardware are polluting the system. That that goes without saying. You know, eating bad food, eating good food. You know, what what it doesn't do is it doesn't actually change the meaning of you know Aunt Matilda's being so critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so again, if I, go arm, if I go to Aunt Matilda's house armed with extra serotonin, I might be able to laugh off some of, her, some of the crap that she gives me. <laughs> and on the other hand, if I go there and I'm a little depleted, I, I, don't, you know, I can't even walk through the door without getting irritated. You know, I'm already I'm, I'm armed ahead of time. So, so, so the functional basis of relating to Aunt Matilda exists and continues as a product of our emotion. We established her as meaning that to us. She still kind of means that, but again, you see it's a little fluid depending on what's happening to the hardware. 
So of course it helps for us to have our brain happy and snappy and you know doing everything healthy, not to mention our body. And that's optimizing that angle of everything vegetative that serves as the setting of the table for everything volitional. And similarly, everything we're doing in the volitional world is messing up what's happening with the you know, stability and the functioning, the clarity, the performance, the purity of the hardware material. So, so we can screw ourselves up or we can elevate ourselves working from either angle. If I do want to change my relationship to Aunt Matilda, I'm going to have to talk my way through it. I can't chemical my way through it unless I decide to give her arsenic. <laughs> in which case we have a whole different set of issues <laughs> indeed yeah so and i can even give myself the arsenic that handles her right problem solved um so, so the mind will grapple with meaning the, the brain will continue to swim in, in in the biochemical soup so i i was picturing I, last time i was talking about you know taking your brain in a box to the practitioner right so so i actually sort of modified the image so, so your brain sort of sits here in this, you know, kind of liquid um, box, you know, like the, the, the skull kind of contains it and it's kind of, you know, suspended and it floats around and it's sort of protected. And conceivably, we, we could cut open uh, the head, the skull, take the brain out, put a couple extenders on it, you know, because you can't take it very far and put it across the room. And obviously we'd have to put it in a, in a containment apparatus that did the same thing as our head does. It's cushy and you know, suspended and well taken care of. And so I'm sitting over here, I could look at my brain over there on the table. My brain's an organ. The brain's over there, but obviously I'm using it in order to be able to see it. The brain isn't telling me just how weird this experience is. I'm telling me how weird this experience is. And you know, given that I'm human, I might be disgusted by it. Ew, look, it's all ew, mushy and, you know, <laughs> if you see a picture of your brain, it's not exactly the most attractive thing in there. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, what would happen if I touch it? You know, like I got curiosity <laughs> and the professionals in the room hopefully would say, don't touch it. <laughs> Cause you can't really mess with the physical structure of it without messing with everything, right? So, so my mind should respect my brain. Now, I get depressed. If I have a poorly functioning brain and, and my morale is influenced by uh, signals coming from my body regarding uh, nausea, discomfort, pain, you know, something sort of heavy and if, if, if that is just happening from my body, my mind is searching for the explanation of why this is happening. I have no anchor in meaning to it. So I could give somebody LSD and not tell them, and they will think they're psychotic within minutes or you know, a half hour. because They have no basis for, in their mind to explain themselves to themselves. But at that point, they're feeling betrayed by the body completely. So if, if I actually look to make changes, you know, for a person relative to what's happening in the domain of what's meaningful, I want chemical support by way of, you know, setting a nice table, but that won't get us anything if we have to actually dissect, alter, modify, shift what's meaningful. So I take the LSD, without knowing it, I'm having a psychotic break and somebody says, oh, they put acid in your drink. Within minutes, I'm having an LSD trip, not a psychosis, you see? So, so the meaning is absolutely critical and the meaning gives the instructions to the brain. So is love birthed from oxytocin or is oxytocin generated because of the will to love? So, so I can, you know, unite mother and, and newborn child and try to extract all the oxytocin and I might mess her up in terms of her ability to, to bring it. And she's like thinking, why aren't I feeling it, right? 
again, if I told her I did that, her will would try to find love beyond it, beneath it, in spite of it. Think about that. Hmm. So Mike, that, this is very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about functional PTSD. So now, aside from, let's say we we're involving a situation that didn't involve physical trauma, okay? Right, right. But emotional trauma early in life. Right. right. So now, the ability to see signals or interpret signals from the brain or from the body yeah. moves through a totally different lens at this point. And is this part of the reason why individuals may have difficulties with, with growing new relationships or with trust or with a variety of pieces that people are often challenged with when they have PTSD early in life or trauma early in life? Yeah. Um, such a, a, an abusive parent, whether it's verbal, mostly verbal, for example, um, or an incident that occurred that shifts. Mike, I, go ahead and, and just and, and share with us a little bit about that. So uh, I, I have a great graph, but I can't spend the time to find it. It'll take 10 minutes. But where are these things being used? Um, so PTSD is a very, very important um, issue because of what it demonstrates about this mind uh, body dance so it, it's traumatic by virtue of what so we we will you know define a trauma based on assumptions we make about the gravity of of certain and uh, negative impact of certain circumstances you know like you thought your life was threatened or something right um but I don't think trauma can be measured objectively. I think trauma actually can only legitimately be measured subjectively. And it really occurs this way. So what, what is overwhelming fear to an average two and a half year old? And what is overwhelming fear to a 19 year old soldier? And what, what they have in common is an emotional response that exceeds the built-in tolerance. So we can't expect the two-year-old to have the tolerance of the 19-year-old, but we can't expect the 19-year-old to tolerate everything, to have no limits. You know, when we say everybody has their breaking point, literally what we mean is breaking their spirit and trauma is evidence of this. So uh, the vulnerability of the two-year-old is inarguably, you know, obvious and evident. And the idea that the two-year-old would have this, you know, very limited tolerance of fear is uh, you know, kind of accepted and understood. What the two-year-old does and what the 19-year-old does in, in principle is very similar in the face of trauma, which starts out with a system-wide command to shut down, you know, nuclear power plant, shut it down. So that tends to be the first response to trauma, that numb, that shock, that shutdown, disconnect. Uh, people can look like zombies for minutes, if not for days in that phase, as you know. Now that's the system protecting itself. Short circuit, pull the plug, psh, you know. Now, during that period of, of shock and disconnect, something's being established within the system that has, that has life in the meaningful world and has life in the physiochemical world. What has life in the meaningful world is in essence the emotional conclusion I cannot go there. I can never go there. Well, why does not, why, why do you say not right now? Well, that's, that's just the immediate conclusion by a system that's been devastated inside its own meaningful existence. The accompanying arrangement at the hardware level, with the physiochemistry, the, the muscular skeletal learning, like all the things that are taking place get cemented and supported and staying in cement by the emotional conclusion, we will not budge, we will defend. We cannot handle, we must defend, like whatever version of that the person is living. Now it becomes part of the treatment folklore to recognize that people will naturally avoid reminders and you know, the places and the things that are going to re-trigger them. They've taken it further to put handcuffs on practitioners conceptually by saying, whatever you do, don't re-traumatize them. 
I'm not re-traumatizing people. I'm actually getting them to move back to the original experience to allow it to stop being stopped and to regain the flow that was cut short by the, the shock and the defensive commitment. So in a real sense, trauma is resolved by having people experience it fully for the first time. 20 years later, 30 years later, it doesn't matter. When they pull the plug, natural processing that might have occurred doesn't get to occur. Natural development evolution that might have occurred and been supported doesn't get to occur and doesn't get to be supported. So Mike, so, it's, it's, you're unclogging the drain. Unclogging the drain by actually going to the clog in the drain, right. <laughs> recognizing, you know, like a, a surgeon, imagine telling a surgeon, you know, um, take out that organ and, you know, replace it, um, but don't cut them. <laughs> uh, you know, and think about what we do. Well, can we do it orthoscopically? And, you know, we try to, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, but there has there's going to be there's going to be some bruises. There's going to be some pain. And 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 that is what was originally rejected in the first place. Remember, too much pain. So so the good news is, well, the two and a half year old doesn't upgrade his or her commitments unless they're pointed out. Like the mind needs to take hold of this, this self-improvement challenge. You know how when you were two and a half and um, you know, your, your father abused you and you shut down and you got anxious and you, of course, you know how we've been talking about it. It's been sort of showing up in your life in different ways and, and causing some trouble. I get, I finally get that. Yeah. So, so the problem is, you know, in order to fix it, we kind of got to go back to it. And that's bad news to people, but it's good news because at least now we have a handle on what needs to be done. And it is how many years later? See, we don't, we don't try to resolve the two and a half year old's trauma when they're four. <laughs> we wait till they're 14 and they've got symptoms. And they have the ability to say, all right, I, I, I'm willing to bring my courage, you know, bring, if I have to feel this pain again, as long as you promise me, it'll help me feel better. I guess I'm willing to do it. So we require the willingness and the courage of the client to participate in this. But after all, it is their mind they're trying to take control over again. Like, so I can't give them control over their mind through Zoloft. I can support it, but it doesn't change any of the meanings for them. My job still sucks. I can tolerate it more. That's very helpful. What about finding a job that really fulfills you or finding a you that can really feel fulfilled on this job? That occurs in the meaningful world. If, wow. can, can I jump in here? Because one of the questions that we've received from our viewers seems to ask the same question, but instead of it, it, it asks it kind of from a, an opposite perspective, if you will, you know, rather than an emotional trauma, um, this question is uh, actually dealing with a physical trauma. Why is it that uh, people who may have lost a limb due to physical injury um, still feel like they have that limb? You know, is that the brain or is that the mind telling them that that trauma either didn't happen or, or is that a, a compensational um, mechanism for dealing with that trauma? That's, well, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. Very interesting question. In traditional medicine, we call that phantom limb or phantom mm -hmm. pain. And it goes back to a neurological reflex, uh, an arc in the brain that suggests that, yes, that limb is still present. Um, Mike, do you have a, a, a different version uh, in the psychological world uh, for this one? Um, well, yeah, no, so I, I, think it, I think it illustrates the, um, the, the both and rather than the either or. Um, I miss my limb. I'll daydream about my limb. You know, there's, there, there's certainly, you know, the, uh, the body memory and there's certainly, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the tradition uh, neurologically of having this, this you know, synapse extend three feet beyond where it's now stopping. And so it, it excites itself that way. 
it, it, it reminds us in our mind at that point that the arm once existed, makes us think, does it still exist in some way? You know, you, you can get an itch out there. Like imagine that, <laughs> you know, like there's an itch out here in a part of the arm that no longer exists, you know, virtual scratching, you know? Um, so as I sit there and my, you know, the body is neurologically quiet or cooperative, I could still be daydreaming because I'm thinking about reaching for a glass and remembering that that used to be something I could easily do. And that would then excite the nerve saying, yeah, remember that? So again, that, that's circularly organized. That goes in both directions. Um, you know, we don't have the working computer without the hardware and the software. We, talk, we, know, we, we know they're separable. Right. I mean, the software companies over there, you know, doing their thing without the zeros and the ones. Right. And the hardware companies over here with the chips and everything, making sure that the zeros and ones come out. Uh, we don't traffic in zeros and ones as software users, do we? Although without the zeros and one, the binary code, this wouldn't exist. And I'm thinking, how many, how many freaking zeros and ones are we talking about? <laughs> well, <laughs> think about it. They wouldn't fit in this room, you know, good luck trying to handle that. Um, but what's meaningful to me, you know, could, could the zeros and ones that represent um, what I was thinking about having for lunch step forward, you, you know, like, I, I don't relate to them. I can't use that information. What I'm relating to in the phantom limb, I mean, there's just, there's still so much information about my arm. There's so much information about my arm. You know, I, I lose a loved one. I can, I can feel closer to them and I feel the pain of missing them. And I couldn't imagine that's how it would go until I get there. And, and what is that to the body? What is, what is missing somebody to the body? You know, what's going on there? Well, here, let's give you some chemistry that feels like a hug. Is that the hug from the body you're missing? No, no, but think about this. I'm sort of daydreaming and picture them hugging me and you give me a chemical that makes me feel hugged. This is, you know, this would be a, this would be a great intervention if we could come up with it. You know, like let's have the brain and the, and the mind sort of meet and hold hands and go somewhere meaningful and purposeful. Instead of, you know, always wondering how we fit together. <clears throat> Should, should you take care of your mind like you take care of a child? Yeah. Should you take care of your brain like you take care of a child? Yeah. A lot of love, a lot of attention. And listen to the experts, right? Because, you know, don't make, don't make it up at all. <laughs> and yeah, all the old wives' tales should be submitted to science to, you know, to see if we could figure out if there's anything to them. It turns out there's often a lot to them, isn't there? Indeed. Mr. Wells. I was going to say there's a, a another question that came in that's kind of in the same vein, which asks, does the mind trick the brain to ignore other physiological conditions that might be happening in the body, um, like feeling hungry even though you've eaten or um, yeah. being in pain uh, if you but you don't really have an injury? Yeah. Uh, well, that's the interesting thing about the mind. Um, the mind can have agendas about the agendas about the agendas. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we can take a perfectly clear, straightforward life and make a labyrinth out of it. And, and we, can, we can take a labyrinth and pretend it's a parking lot. And, uh, and either way, we'll have unfortunate consequences because what we're doing is we're, we're messing with the map of our own world. So this is why I say in the end that defenses end up sort of being implicated in all things ongoing and problematic. If, if my defense is to take a life that's painfully simple and empty and turn it into a drama, that day by day, you know, puts me uh, in touch with the urgency of every single action and every single moment. Have I done myself a favor? Defending against the boring and the mundane by creating a whole lot of melodrama. 
if you work with human beings, you realize many people are up to that. <laughs> many people are doing that. Rather than have a life of painful insignificance, they've turned it into an ongoing melodrama that they get to complain about. But, but it becomes um, you know, more full of significance and gravitas. This is the whole Don Quixote mistake. Your life is actually, your, your life is actually what it was supposed to be before your mind messed with it. Mike, let me ask you, so this is a kind of off topic question, but maybe related. Is this why maybe we find so much intrigue in, uh, in our Western culture with watching television programs that are just full of drama? Yes. The real yeah. housewives of blah, 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 or the real yeah. this and that. You know, yeah. and I, I just kind of never understood why are people getting involved? Well, in well so, so, here's the, so here's the irony. Um, so try to picture sustaining interest when your interest has been exhausted. Mm. Try to picture sustaining interest when your interest has been exhausted. It's, it, it's, Got it. Got it. It's, it, it's close to impossible. It creates a, um, an aversion about the, the process and the challenge. And, uh, you know, look, we can do it. Uh, you think, think about all the people going to work because they have to make a living, you know, like, I'm not interested in this, and yet I am interested in living, so I daydream, I do whatever I can while my body is stuck, you know, with this mundane routine thing. Most people have exhausted interest in their own lives, believe it or not. Wow. This is what I'm saying, this is what I'm saying about contempt. My life is mostly about my pain. Why the hell would I want to wake up in the morning and pay close attention to it? Mm. Everything that distracts me, everything that helps me escape, everything that relieves me of this, see, it's beyond boredom. There's a, there's a bitterness to it. There's a, there's a cynicism. There's a contempt about it. For some people, it's much more you know, visceral and vitriolic, and you, you can feel it. Others, it's just like, you know, I lost interest. I, I no longer am interested. When, when people say, you know, I love you, I'm just not in love with you. This is what they're kind of talking about. <laughs> it's definitely being downgraded, you know? <laughs> and at some point, I, I, I'm not in love with you, but I do love you, is followed by, I'm not sure I love you anymore, I found somebody else. Because the new interest when I fall in love, right? Now, I've taken my life and I've rendered it virtually pointless. So I'm sitting here and I could spend the next hour or two, you know, feeling that and realizing that and stewing in that, or I could turn on the TV, either watch somebody who's worse off than me and feel better <coughs> about myself, or watch somebody who's better off than me and, and sit there and have envy, you know, and, and, and longing. But at least it's like something to shoot for. There's, a, there's an incentive. To it and um and somebody else sitting there looking at this is like you know you could be doing something productive with your time <laughs> mm -hmm. and while that's theoretically true what they would be doing with their time is just stewing you know mulling over their sense of life is empty life is shitty life is boring whatever mike i think that's an area we need to visit yes. because this is so powerful in our Western culture today um, that it definitely uh, necessitates some real exploration because Absolutely. billions of dollars are being created and spent around this very concept that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It is just mm -hmm. amazing to me. Um, and what does that say about us? It's saying as a culture, um, are we either that miserable or that bored? And yeah. how do we look to, to address those things? I mean, I don't think that maybe to some degree, people are kind of aware of how miserable they are. And of course, the need to escape. Um, others are aware of how bored they are. So they may go involve, get involved in extreme sports or extreme mm -hmm. this or, mm -hmm. or something to, to do the mindscape escape, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is a, a very, very significant area. I'm glad you brought it up. I was not even thinking about that, but a very significant area that I think really needs to be addressed and could help a lot of people. So you know, when they when they talk about yeah, 
when, when they talk about, um, you know, addiction being a disease, uh, I don't actually think it resides in the brain as a disease, not that the brain can't get disease and, you know, really sort of sponsor uh, the, the compulsive acting out. Uh, we have this as an epidemic because of chronically low morale among the masses. It, it, it is a sociocultural phenomenon. It is a philosophical and meaningful challenge. It's not just a physical disease. So, 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 Mike, if I can jump in here, one of the questions that's being asked right now is, so if we're treating addiction, do we treat the mind or do we treat the brain? Yeah, well, you know, if you leave one home, you're probably missing both of them. So <laughs> you, you have to look at it. You have to look at it as a two pronged uh, uh, challenge. Um, if if I have a very depleted brain, so anorexia is a, is a good example. Is having starved themselves for so long, the brain doesn't even have nourishment to to connect neurons while you're trying to talk to them. You know, it's kind of like. Well, we kind of got to like bring your brain back a little there. You're not even going to be able to use your software because it's, it's deficient. It's just across the board. So uh, you can't separate the two. Now, where does more of the problem lie? Well, that's a case by case consideration. And, and at no point should anybody be so, you know, imperious or cavalier about this that they say, yeah, it's all the mind after the other side. You know, I'm like, no, this is, let's rule this out over here. If this is my specialty, I do a lot of ruling out over here. Because it's foolish of me to talk about, you know, how it felt when you were growing up, you know, and your mother was the way she was when we find out you have a brain tumor. You know, like, let's see what that means first. You know, like, all these headaches, they could be, you know, psychogenic pain. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's have an MRI. Let's, you know, it's, it just makes no sense to think that you're gonna treat the whole organism by, by, half, by looking at half the elephant. Absolutely, absolutely. The brain and the mind always walk through the door together. Now, there might be a conflict, but it doesn't get through the door if it's not if they're not joined. So it makes no sense to, to think that you know half the equation is going to answer the whole problem. Well, gentlemen, we're starting to get low on time here, but I think we do have time for one more question that came in. Um, and this goes back to your discussion uh, early in your, your presentation, Dr. Lukens, uh, uh, volition versus reflex. Um, and, and someone was asking, can we make conscious actions more reflexive? Things like with athletes practicing something over and over and over again until they say it becomes an automatic thing that they don't even have to think about anymore. Yeah, well, no pun intended, but that's kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, practice does make perfect, in fact, because, you know, I, I, I look to my learning how to drive um, a, a stick shift, having trained on an automatic transmission, now, this, which goes back a few years. Um, you, there were a lot of cars that were uh, manual transmissions. And uh, everything I learned about driving, um, you know, using the automatic transmission, uh, you would think would just sort of transfer. And, uh, and in fact, some of it did because I'd been doing that for a while. But now I had to add a whole new set of behaviors and it was very clunky. It was very purposeful, it was very intentional. And, you know, the clutches, you know, you're banging and you're not smooth. And, and you can think to yourself, I'm never going to figure this out. <laughs> and and what, ha what happens is, you know, in two months, you know, you're talking, you're looking around, and you're just doing everything very automatically. So, of course, there's learning. The effects of learning and practice is where that action is. So if you made a choice to learn how to drive a stick shift, you're not possessed of, you know, all the knowledge you need muscle-wise and coordination-wise and what have you to begin with, but within a matter of time, you will, it will become automatic. You can do it in your sleep. Now, so <laughs> I, uh, when I was in graduate school, I had, I had two light blue Volkswagen Beetles. You couldn't really tell them apart from the outside, okay? 
but one was a complete manual with the stick shift and the clutch. And the other was one of these weird hybrids where it had a stick shift, but there was no clutch. So if you touched the stick shift that went into neutral, but it only had one pedal, right? The brake. So I'm out late at night, uh, ran an errand, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back and um, I'm, I'm approaching a, um, a light that I knew was gonna turn green like any minute, you know, like how you do those things a little riskily where you're anticipating the green and you go and I'm anticipating the green and I look out, you know, my peripheral vision is showing me that somebody's not gonna be stopping. So I need to stop. Now, in, in the clutch car, both feet attack both pedals like instantly, right? Both teeth, and, and, and yet the left foot, the clutch has to go all the way to the floor. In my mind, I thought I was in the other car and both my feet went for the brake. Now, it was good because I stopped, but I nearly put myself through my own windshield because of the vehemence with which I stopped. Like it was my left foot trying to kill me when I was looking for the clutch. So we, we have that kind of, you know, what is the mind up to? Yeah, I've laid tracks, but then again, I've confused it. I'm a little ambivalent. I have to call upon my motor memory or what have you in a second. And, you know, it got, I got some sort of weird combo, both feet trying to find that one pedal. So again, it illustrates, we can't talk about brain separate from mind, mind separate from brain. You just, you know, I mean, you can talk about it, but it, in the end, what explains the, the eventual action, the eventual behavior? We, we need both, we need, we need both. Do we talk about percentages? I mean, what was the percentage of my mind and, and my brain? See, I, I think that became almost automatic like the eye blink because of the necessity of calling upon the behavior faster than hell. Like I, it was, I was in that crisis situation. So we're, I, there was no time to think, right? No time to think. So what got pulled up was, you know, the, this is that car. The feet did what they're supposed to do. If this was that car, it wasn't that car. Well, we are nearing the end of our allotted time. Uh, Dr. Mensa, any final ideas or comments or, or, or questions that you want to pose before we wrap things up? Absolutely. I think the commentary that I have is that this, this conversation has just brought forth an explosion of, of topics that I think, Mike, we, we need to revisit, actually to visit together um, as we look at you know, the, the science around the brain and dysregulation based upon chemistry versus the interpretation of those signals, et cetera, in situations like depression, anxiety, um, PTSD, certainly, of course. But then I've got one for you, Mike, when we talk about schizophrenia, okay? Mm -hmm. And we talk about the various types of schizophrenia. I'm very, very curious about mm -hmm. what your insight would be into these discussions. So, Mr. Wells, I think we did have a, a, a few more conversations here. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Lukens. And so we'll be looking forward to those. Absolutely. I'd be, ha I'd be happy to be very interested in continuing the conversation. Um, I appreciate you guys giving me this opportunity. Uh, I, um, I'm very grateful. And uh, yeah, no, I, <laughs> There's, there's a lot of things I have a, a different kind of opinion about, so be happy to share it. Speaking of sharing those opinions, Dr. Lukens, uh, uh, Dr. Mensa mentioned earlier that you've got a couple of new books in publication. Um, how can we uh, access those? How can folks uh, get a copy or, or, or contact you? Well, I, what, what do you guys suggest? I mean, they, they could reach out via my email. We could give them my email. Um, they could go to the website. The books are available on uh, lulu.com. Um, so there's the, uh, the two addiction books and the, and the first uh, volume of the, the physics of emotion and the big theory book. Um, so uh, I don't know, is that the best way for them to, to do this? I think what we can do is we can certainly offer um, we can get that information and put it up on our site. 
Yes, that so would be good. Yeah, yeah. yeah access yeah. that, and we'll put it on uh, both the Mensa Research Institute and the Mensa Medical website. Mm -hmm. And so that'll give folks a, a real easy transition into accessing these wonderful, provoking, provoking um, books and insights from Dr. Lukens. People may not know this. Dr. Lukens is a real leader in the field, and his work is is as shared with me by his colleagues, by the way, his work is really unparalleled. So don't let that calm demeanor fool you. Um, he's a dynamo in the, in the thought world, shall we say, and in the emotional world and the feeling world. And this is why we're having these conversations because we're, we're really learning from someone who's a true pioneer. So Dr. Lukens, Mike, I wanna thank you uh, tremendously. And like I said, we will be looking forward to our next conversation we begin to broach some of these other topics that are just so prevalent in our culture, but sometimes mm -hmm. just so minimized because they're so ever present. I think now we've got a chance to look at them through a different lens. So thank agree. you. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. I will be back. Thank you. Okay. And, and thanks to all of you for spending some time with us this afternoon. Um, I want to remind you that this is part of our integrated, integrative mental health series uh, that we are doing in conjunction with Journey's Dream. Uh, continue to uh, keep your eyes open for monthly content from Journey's Dream and from the Mensa Research Institute as we continue the important conversations that we started at the Integrative Mental Health Summit back in October. And we'll certainly continue, and I would imagine, Dr. Lukens, that you'll be joining us as well. Uh, when we have our next mental health summit. So uh, more opportunities for you to hear from uh, this, this wise and, 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 and prestigious uh, scholar. So thanks again for spending time with us and we will see you next time.